Inspired Insanity The Turbulent Life of Vincent Van Gogh If chickens could smile, the coop of clucking hens surely would have done so when they viewed the man in the blue shirt against the swirling green background. It was about time their owners brightened up their dreary environment of chicken wire and beaten up boards. Even though the family they shared the yard with apparently didn't like the vibrant picture, they did. It provided a colorful distraction during their mundane egg-sitting duties. It didn't matter to them that the painting had been re-gifted, it was now theirs. Then sadly, just as suddenly as it had appeared, the portrait vanished, leaving them once again staring at boards and wire. The picture's subject, Dr. Felix Ray, had shown the appropriate gratitude for the complimentary portrait when it was presented to him. His enthusiasm had not been particularly easy to muster since he was not exactly in love with it. Years later, Ray confided his true feelings to an interviewer. He said that when he saw Van Gogh had painted his hair and mustache in blazing red on a biting green background, he was horrified. Fortunately, Ray was as good an actor as a doctor and masked his feelings of horror. As he profusely thanked the artist, he not only needed to employ his best performing abilities, he had to project nice and loud. After all, his benefactor had only one ear. Dr. Ray was the young intern who was on duty at the hospital in Ajala, France, in December of 1888, when a bleeding, hallucinating Vincent van Gogh appeared. Ray was informed that the previous night, Vincent had severed his own ear and was suffering from severe blood loss. The policeman who accompanied him not only turned Vincent over to the doctor, but gave him the ear as well. Realizing it was no longer able to be reattached, Dr. Ray plopped it in a jar of alcohol and turned his attention to its previous owner. Employing his newly acquired medical skills, the young intern treated and bandaged the patient, unaware he was also entering the art history books. Later, the discarded portrait ended up in Dr. Ray's attic. That's where his mother found it when she was snooping around for something to patch a hole in their chicken coop. Like her son, she despised the picture and felt this would be the ideal use for it. Apparently, Dr. Ray later had second thoughts about the use of his portrait to repair a chicken coop. History is fuzzy as to whether he sold it to a local art dealer for a nominal amount or simply gave it to him. Either way, the painting entered the art world. Like most of Van Gogh's pictures, nobody was interested in purchasing it. Several years later, though, the portrait of Dr. Ray would find a home in Moscow's Pushkin Museum. Although the legend of the painting that once graced their ancestor's coop has likely been passed down through generations of local chickens, they will most likely never be able to reacquire the portrait. A 2015 estimate set its value at $50 million. Like Van Gogh's legendary painting style with its dramatic swirls and bold, quick brushstrokes, his life flew by in a series of striking condensed scenes. During his intense 37-year existence, he was called everything from a bum to a madman to a genius. Even his childhood in the Netherlands fit the bizarre mold that would later shape the rest of his life. His father, Theodorus, was a stern and emotionally detached country minister. Vincent's mother, Anna Corelia, was locally known as a moody artist. Both her love of art and her morose nature were apparently transmitted to her oldest child. In a bizarre fluke, Vincent was born exactly one year after his parents' first child, also named Vincent, who arrived stillborn. 
They buried him, which resulted in Vincent's name, birth month, and day already etched on his dead brother's headstone. Much of his early life was plagued by a growing depression. At the age of 15, Vincent left school and began working to help shore up his family's failing finances. His first job at his uncle's art dealership would seem to be the ideal start for an artist in the making. As with many of his later experiences, however, young Vincent's moodiness and quarrelsome streak often sabotaged his own goals. Although he had not yet decided to become a painter, this exposure to artwork aroused his creative sensitivity. Unfortunately, he expressed that sensitivity by frequently telling potential customers not to buy paintings he felt didn't meet his standards. Usually, he didn't recommend other pictures in the gallery they should buy, but simply talked them out of buying the worthless art they were considering. As might be expected, when his uncle learned about the situation, young Vincent's future was freed for other employment opportunities. Following abbreviated jobs as a language teacher and lay preacher in England and a bookseller in the Netherlands, he decided his life work should be in the ministry. After a brief training period in Brussels, he took up theology. Once again, his limited interpersonal skills and lack of interest in developing any bombarded his plans for the future. When ministering for the Church of Belgium, he decided to give away his belongings and moved to an impoverished coal mining village in the south of the country. The villagers loved him as he preached and ministered to the sick and drew complimentary pictures of the miners and their families. In fact, he was given the nickname of Christ of the Coal Mines. The evangelical committees of the church, on the other hand, felt he was overzealous and was taking on a tone of martyrdom. Accordingly, they refused to renew his contract. They think I'm a madman, he told an acquaintance, because I wanted to be a true Christian. This rejection would prompt his decision to pursue a career as a full-time artist. His future ministry, he decided, would be accomplished through his artwork. I wanted to give the wretched a brotherly message, he wrote to his younger brother Theodore. He said that when he signed his paintings with only Vincent, it is as one of them. Following his decision, he briefly attended the Antwerp Academy, then visited numerous art museums and studied with several emerging Impressionist artists. Although his artistic career would span only one decade, from 1880 until 1890, his style passed through various phases. Much of his earlier work, like the gloomy depiction of poverty in The Potato Eaters, was dark and morose. After he met and studied with Henry de Toulouse-Lautrec, Camille Pissarro, and Paul Gauguin, he began to enliven his work with vivid colors. Most of his celebrated work sprang from only the last three years of his life when he began to work with a compulsive abandon. He painted the first series of his now famous sunflower pictures in France not long after his infamous ear incident. During the months following his emotional breakdown, he recuperated in an asylum in the south of France where he painted the scenes around him including olive orchards and wheat fields. The results of this period now grace the world's museums. At the depth of his mental illness during his voluntary stay in the asylum, he was confined to two cells, one of which he used as a studio. This morning I saw the countryside from my window a long time before sunrise, he wrote his brother. There was nothing but the morning star, he continued, which looked very big. The vision of that star would be forever immortalized in the starry night. 
Though I am often in the depths of misery, Vincent would explain, there is still calmness, pure harmony, and music inside me.